cabina 30-30 que los rebeldes portaban y decían los maderistas que con ellas no mataban. La Revolución Mexicana was the first revolution of modern times that placed the needs and dreams of the Mexican people as a priority of the movement. Yet the story has several chapters, making it easy to get lost in it if you don't know how this part of our history unfolded over a period of 30 years. This video provides a short description of what happened during this important part of Mexican history. Between the years 1810 and 1821, the war for Mexican independence against Spain was led by great raza patriots like Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla and José María Morelos. After Spain had been defeated, Mexico was three times larger than it is today and included the areas of Centro America, now known as Belice, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. To the north, what are now called the states of Arizona, California, Nevada, Texas, Utah, and parts of Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming were also a part of Mexican national territory. In less than 30 years, greed, attacks from the United States, and weak leaders within the country had broken Mexico, and by 1848, it was reduced to what it is today. Mexico was almost destroyed by the weakness and the greed within the so-called leadership of Antonio López de Santana and the power of the church, until several uprisings brought the great Oaxaqueño leader Benito Juárez to the presidency in 1858. Under the leadership of Benito Juárez, the Mexicano people made great political advances and were able to unite against and defeat the French invasion of Mexico in 1862. It was during this period when the name of the first character of the Mexican Revolution became known, José de la Cruz Porfirio Díaz Mori. Porfirio Díaz did not start as a dictator. In his younger years, he had been a famous and respected soldier from Oaxaca and was admired for his courage when he had led an important cavalry attack against the French invaders during the Battle of Puebla on Cinco de Mayo, 1862. He was originally a radical and a friend to Benito Juárez, yet even before the death of Juárez, Porfirio Díaz had turned his back on his comrade and mentor, and had become a puppet of European power. Porfirio Díaz rose in power until he assumed control of the presidential chair in 1876, with the Porfiriato lasting 34 years, from 1876 to 1911. Outside of Mexico, he was called the Iron Man of the Americas, promoting laws that favor the rights of foreigners, especially rich investors from Germany and the United States. Don Porfirio maintained almost total control in Mexico using his infamous rurales, the Porfiriato killers and enforcers used to keep control of the people in every pueblo. If the rurales caught you stealing, drunk, or speaking out, against Don Porfirio, they shot you on the spot or sent you to southern plantations to work to death as an imprisoned slave. This is what life and death was about for the great majority of people in Mexico. Terrible poverty, no hope for a better future, and terrorized by the government. But not everything was under the thumb of Don Porfirio. The brothers Ricardo and Enrique Flores Magón worked tirelessly every day to challenge the power of the Porfiriato, and they became famous for fearlessly speaking out against the government. Hiding at night, in graveyards, in the desert, up in the hills, the Flores Magón brothers explained what La Revolución was. They spoke of getting rid of Don Porfirio. They declared Mexico para los Mexicanos and committed themselves to the idea of tierra y libertad. 
Because they had the support of the people, the Rurales found it impossible to catch the Flores Magón brothers, although they finally were forced to escape to the United States. While hiding in different border towns, Ricardo Flores Magón helped form the Partido Liberal Mexicano and started a newspaper named Regeneración. Very serious problems continued to spread across Mexico, and the exploitation of workers was worse than ever. In Cananea, Sonora, the Consolidated Copper Company, owned by one of the richest men in the United States, William Cornell Green, treated the Mexicano workers terribly. On June 1, 1906, among rumors that the Flores Magón brothers were in the area, Mexicano workers at Consolidated Copper declared themselves on strike. Una huelga. Within days, troops from the Arizona and Texas Rangers crossed the border into Mexico, and together the Rurales and the Porfirieto Army violently put down the strike. Hundreds of workers were wounded and killed. It was a massacre. Across Mexico, people agreed that Don Porfirio sabía pasado de la raya. It was time for him to give up his power. But there was a difference between the rich that only wanted Don Porfirio to change and la gente revolucionaria, on the other hand, that wanted all of Mexico to change. When there is a crisis and a possible rising up of the poor, there will always be a rich guy ready to claim he is the leader. Francisco E. Madero became part of the anti-reelectionist movement, demanding Don Porfirio not force himself to be reelected. Diaz immediately ordered the arrest of Madero, and before he could be captured, he went into hiding in San Antonio, Texas. From Texas, alone, with no army, Francisco Madero ended up declaring the beginning of La Revolución on November 20th, 1910, at 6 p.m. Madero had no way of actually starting La Revolución himself, but he took it upon himself to declare the beginning of La Revolución. Even without the knowledge of Madero, small bands of revolucionarias and revolucionarios had started forming outside of pueblos across the country, and the idea of La Revolución began to spread. The Flores Magón brothers had prepared themselves. From Los Angeles and San Diego, they organized attacks on Baja California as a first organized rebel action taken on behalf of La Revolución Mexicana. Winning control of Mexicali on January 29, 1911, Tecate on April 25, Tijuana on May 8, and San Quintín on May 13th. Across Mexico, the rich realized that they might lose control of this movement to get rid of Porfirio, and if they lost control over the poor in Mexico, the poor might come after them next. Two leaders came to represent the revolutionary interests of the poor in Mexico, General Francisco Villa and General Emiliano Zapata. Madero who was still in hiding in Texas, understood their power, and he immediately named Villa as General of the División del Norte. And to the south, Emiliano Zapata formed the revolutionary División del Sur. Villa and Zapata declared open rebellion in support of Madero at first. Again, as is typical, another rich guy saw what was happening and declared himself the true leader of La Revolución. Venustiano Carranza, a rich hacendado from Coahuila, with an army he formed by giving rifles to the peones that worked on his haciendas. It was clear now that everyone wanted Don Porfirio out, and even before any major battle had taken place, Porfirio Díaz, the former Iron Man of the Americas, boarded the steamship Ipiranga, leaving Mexico on May 31, 1911, for Paris, France, never again to return. On June 7, 1911, Madero entered Mexico City as a new president. Madero got his wish. All he had wanted was to be president, not Tierra y Libertad, not Mexico para los Mexicanos. Madero kept 90% of the old Porfiriato government officials and army generals, 
and he promoted the most terrible general of all as his number one backup, Victoriano Huerta. Huerta did not respect Madero, and when Madero asked Huerta to put down a rebellion to protect his new government, Huerta instead arrested Madero and threw him in prison declared himself president and the leader of a new Porfiriato. On February 21, 1913, news reached Mexico City that Madero had been shot and his head cut off as he was trying to escape. Victoriano Huerta had in fact ordered the murder of Francisco Madero. During this period, the globe was in the grip of World War I, with millions of people dying on battlefields across Europe. The Russian Revolution had a tremendous impact on how people around the world understood politics, power, and freedom. It was this series of events that opened up the time for real revolutionary unity in Mexico. Flores Magón, Villa, Zapata, and even Carranza all had a deep hatred for Huerta, and even more so for having so viciously murdered the weak-minded Madero. By July of 1914, Victoriano Huerta was beaten and forced to resign. Carranza quickly declared himself president and announced to everyone, The revolution is over. Time to turn in your guns. But Villa and Zapata did not agree and instead demanded answers. Who owns the land? Who controls the riches of Mexico? How much power do the workers and campesinos have? Thus, the next stage of La Revolución became the fight of Carranza and Obregón versus Villa and Zapata. Venustiano Carranza and Álvaro Obregón had the support of the rich minority. Francisco Villa and Emiliano Zapata had the support of the poor majority. Government power went back and forth between these armies. Villa and Zapata would take over Mexico City one week, and the next week, Carranza's troops would be back in power. It went on like this for several years until the United States decided to intervene and support Carranza. The United States government allowed Carranza and Obregón to secretly transport troops and supplies from the U.S. on U.S. trains in order to prepare an ambush. As a result of this intervention from the United States, the Villistas were defeated at the Battle of Celaya on April 13, 1915. It was the first major defeat Villa's troops had suffered, and they were nearly destroyed. Villa was furious, since he had gone out of his way not to antagonize the gringos, and he now saw them choosing to get involved to help destroy his army. In retaliation, Villa turned against the United States, and for the first time in its history, the mainland U.S. was attacked in Columbus, New Mexico on March 9, 1916. The U.S. government called upon their top general to punish the Mexicans. General John J. Blackjack Pershing was issued orders to invade Mexico, find and kill General Francisco Villa. General Pershing was sent with 12,000 soldiers and all of the most modern military equipment available at the time. The gringos crossed the border into Mexico on March 14, 1916, and almost a year later, they crossed back into the United States on February 7, 1917, humiliated without having captured Villa and not even once having caught sight of Villa's troops. While Villa was busy dodging the U.S. Army, Carranza promised to make a deal with Zapata. Carranza invited Zapata to unite with him against the gringo invasion and gave his word that the land would soon be given back to the campesinos. But it was all a lie. General Emiliano Zapata was then ambushed and assassinated on April 10, 1919 by order of Venustiano Carranza. Álvaro Obregón, having considered himself a patriot and revolucionario, saw the murder of Zapata as a traitorous act, and seeing the opportunity to be president himself, Obregón rose against Carranza. Carranza was quickly defeated and sent into hiding. On May 21, 1920, Carranza was found hiding in a campesino shack, arrested and shot trying to escape. With Álvaro Obregón in the presidency, Villa accepted his retirement, 
but continued to plan a return to the struggle, until, of course, he was also assassinated on July 20th, 1923. As president of Mexico, Álvaro Obregón had made some social progress, but it was not everything that the Revolución had promised. By 1924, the country did not have a full social and political revolution, as had been hoped for by so many people. Before Álvaro Obregón left the presidency, he gave the presidential dedazo to Plutarco Elias Calles, a man who claimed to be a revolutionary, but in his actions was closer to a Porfiriato-style dictator. And there was a new sector of corrupt Mexicans ready and willing to take advantage of the revolution to make themselves rich, filling their pockets with stolen money, while at the same time filling their mouths with slogans of la revolución. These were the same people that founded the Partido Nacional Revolucionario in 1929, which would later become the PRI. Soldaderas were also known as Las Adelitas, a nickname for mujeres that participated in La Revolución that became popular when it was made into a revolutionary corrido. These mujeres were soldiers within the revolutionary forces of Mexico, the terms Adelita and Soldadera have since come to symbolize a woman of strength and courage. There were thousands of mujeres that served as soldaderas, and they often fulfilled supporting roles behind the front lines of combat, although some also took up arms and gave up their lives during the fight for freedom. These mujeres became well known and respected for their exceptional leadership and incredible contributions to the struggle. One such mujer was Juana Belén Gutierrez de Mendoza, a mujer indígena who was born in Durango in 1875. Throughout her life, she was a revolutionary anti-capitalist journalist, a school teacher, a medical director, and a fighter for the rights of indigenous groups in Mexico. She later became a combatant and political leader in the forces of General Emiliano Zapata, participating in the original development of what became known as a Plan de Ayala. Another widely respected mujer of La Revolución was Petra Herrera, who started out as a combatant in General Francisco Villa's División del Norte. She originally joined Villa's forces disguised as a man and calling herself Pedro Herrera, but as her reputation for courage under fire grew among the ranks, she was promoted to Capitán, and she was given command over a force of 200 men. In October of 1913, after the Battle of Torreón, where Petra played a tremendously important role, she made her gender known to her camaradas. Soon after the victory of Torreón, she was again promoted, this time to Coronela, and instructed to form a fighting brigade made up of nearly 1,000 female combatants. Finally, there was the legendary Dolores Jiménez y Muro. She was born in Aguascalientes on June 7, 1848 where before the revolution, she had worked as a school teacher. Throughout her life, she worked to publish information in numerous newspapers and pamphlets that called for the revolutionary socialist transformation of Mexico. She was already over 60 years old when she decided to join La Revolución, and in 1910 was arrested for her role as president of Las Hijas de Cuauhtémoc, a revolutionary organization that spoke out against the dictatorship of Porfirio Díaz. As a result of her political work in support of La Revolución Mexicana, she drew the attention of General Emiliano Zapata, who soon asked her to join his forces, and awarded her the rank of coronela. Indeed, the period between World War I and World War II was exceptional because of the many explosions of social and political revolution around the world. People were convinced that the transformations that had started in Mexico and Russia were spreading, and rich people across the globe were terrified. As a consequence, ultra-right-wing Nazi-like movements began to spread across the world as well, and Mexico was no exception. It was at this time in 1926 that the Cristero Rebellion started with the support and power of the Catholic Church. Before La Revolución, the Church controlled massive areas of land throughout Mexico. It had its own banks, businesses, and was in charge of the schools. 
the church had opposed every idea and promise of la revolución from the first days. And when it mattered most what side of the revolution you were on, the church took the side of Victoriano Huerta to continue the war against the Villistas and Zapatistas. During the 1920s, the church began to form its own army within Mexico. This religious army became known as the Cristeros. They were armed groups that would attack every form of revolutionary change they could find, especially in the states of Jalisco, Puebla, Zacatecas, and Guanajuato. The Cristeros burned schools and government offices, and they killed teachers and government officials. In 1939, what was left of the Cristeros organized itself as part of the Partido Acción Nacional, and later as a semi-secret organization known as El Yunque, a Mexican-style Nazi party. Álvaro Obregón announced he would run again to be president of Mexico. Those opposed to Obregón were arrested or killed, and in the end, Obregón won the presidential election. Nonetheless, on July 17, 1928, five months before he was to assume the presidency again, Álvaro Obregón was shot in the head by a Cristero rebel named José de León Toral, creating a political crisis and a wave of violence that lasted several years. As nations once again became consumed by world war, it was not until 1934 that many of the goals of La Revolución Mexicana were finally realized during the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas. Lázaro Cárdenas del Río was from Michoacán and had served as a captain during the revolution under Villa and later under Obregón. When he became president, he instituted the land reform that Zapata had fought for, an economic reform through the nationalization of the banks. Cárdenas gave more power to the labor unions, and he led mineral and oil nationalization so that the natural resources of Mexico would benefit the people of Mexico. He supported the development of Mexican music, art, and literature, and sided with the Spanish revolutionaries of the Republic against the Spanish fascists and the German Nazis. Under the presidency of Cárdenas, Mexico entered a golden age of culture, education, political participation, and economic growth that lasted almost 20 years. The lessons of La Revolución Mexicana we should most think about start by understanding that these events took place almost exactly 100 years ago. At that time, before the revolution began, it appeared as though it would be impossible to change the country. People seemed frozen by the violence, the false elections, the corruption, the self-interest, fear, hopelessness, and ignorance of the time. But all these things did not keep the revolution from happening and instead made La Revolución more necessary. These feelings formed the basis of making people willing to do anything, even give up their lives to change Mexico, because they knew the system was much too rotten to change any other way. So as we look at Mexico today, we need to keep this in our minds, and still say with pride and dignity, ¡Que viva la revolución! Maderistas que con ellas no mataban. Con mi 30-30 me voy a marchar, a engrosar las filas de la rebelión. Si mi sangre pide, mi sangre les doy por los habitantes de nuestra nación. Francisco Villa, donde te hayas argumentado, ven parate aquí delante, tu 
Con mi 30-30 me voy a marchar A engrosar las filas de la rebelión Si mi sangre pide, mi sangre les doy Por los habitantes de nuestra nación Ya se va tu negro santo Si me quebra alguna bala De a llorarme al campo santo Con mi 30-30 me voy a marchar A engrosar las filas de la rebelión Si mi sangre pide, mi sangre les doy por los habitantes de nuestra nación